We designed an apartment building to be very friendly on the planet, very low energy. Um, we've got solar panels, we've got a shared electric car, we've got a guest room you can book out for family and friends to come and stay, and we've converted the roof space, uh, which would normally be a, a penthouse apartment, into a shared laundry, uh, barbecue area, it's got views across Auckland, um, coffee machines, it's a, it's a lovely space. We're very untraditional in that we haven't built and sold and recouped the investment straight away. We forfeited some profit at the start in lieu of you know, the long-term benefits. And I have to say, you know, ANZ was very supportive. We wanted to make renting a first-class option and we, we think we've achieved that. Uh, kia ora koutou, kia ora tata. Lead thy people that their pathways are obscured by multiple objects. Assist and embrace those whose seat of affections are sad and distressed. Stand thy stance of a brave chief and chieftainess. Be clear and definite before you chit chat. Be mannerly to thy uninformed. Be cuddly to thy weak and listless people. Salutate thy person upon the gracement of love. Caress thy heart of affliction with your colossal deliberations today. Who will redress you? Only you can improve you. Embraceth, gathereth, anointeth ye. Kia ora koe, kai ahoe o te Titiro ki ngā wai o weta mata e ora nei. Wehe pipi parauro ki tūwa takato te pā i takato te pā. Whiti, whiti, tā, 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 tā. Whiti, whiti, tā, tā, tā. Hera taua ki tūwa takato te pā i tūwa. I takato te pai. Tore rei ngā mana i ngā reo, harauranga tirama e whakarongo nei. Nā, ko tēnei te meki, te haka, te hari o ngā puhi. I te taenga mai o te kau, o te rongo pai, kei wainga ni a rātau. Nā, i tēnei ata, nā, he kaupau anō, he rongo pai, ki a koutou nei tāringa, Ki a koutou e whakarongo nei. Nō reira, ka huri anō ki a koe e te kai karakia e tūwhara te a mātou nei hui i te ato nei. Tēnā koe, tēnā koe. Ka huri anō ki tō tātou nei ki ngi Māori ki ngi tūhei te ato. Ka noho ana i a i runga te ahure wa tapu o ngā mātua o ngā tūpuna. I te ka ahui āriki me ki Dire, dire hau, pai māri re. Nō reira, huri anō ki ngā mate ki ngā tu o koutou. Nā, mihi tonu ki a rātou kua ngaro ki te pō. Nō haere, ki tērā kai ngā tūturu mō tau nei te te tangata ki Hawaii ki nui, Hawaii ki roa, Hawaii ki pā mā mā. Rātou ki a rātou, te hunga mate ki te hunga mate. 
Pakal ke pakal ngawai utang orang sama. Puri no kia kau kau seminggu ngah. Aku tak main ni. Tiada lagi. Apa tu? Apa tu? Kita itu hano. Mata kau norera. Mati asu lah. Hei mana kia hei cia kia kau kau. Ido tu tiada lagi. Norera kau huri tak kuno. I began my greeting with a haka or a song that is. That captures, they call it the the dance of Napuhi. So, at the coming of the the gospel amongst Maori in the Bay of Islands um, in eighteen in the eighteen hundreds, and so today I open my welcome to you all with a paraphrase of that same welcome that. Hopefully you're getting the, the good news. You're getting good news to you all, all of you who are listening and tuned in today. I then turn to our, our person who gave the karakia this morning. Kia koe e te rangatira Richard. Uh, a mihi to him, thanking him for his, his work. A mihi to our Māori king. And then to those who we carry in our hearts and minds, those who have passed away recently so may they rest in peace but to all the attendees today online we welcome you once we welcome you twice we welcome you three times the sun is shining today maybe it'll be a glorious day for, for all of us Tuturu o fiti whakamaua ki a tīna, tīna, haumi e hui e, tāriki e. Kia ora tāta. Nō reina, nō koto, nō mana e nō iwi, e nō rangatera, nō mei, harimai, whakatumai, tēnā koto, tēnā koto, tēnā koto kato. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Richard and Otene, for those inspirational words, and welcome back to day three of our Building Nations Conference. As Claire said last night, we have a jam-packed schedule today. Thank you, first of all, for all the feedback we have received to date. I would encourage you to use the discussion forum to provide us with uh, further feedback, just to ensure that we come back and provide an even better conference next year. So today, returning to our jam-packed schedule, we will hear from the Honourable Dr. Megan Woods, Minister of Housing, and that will be followed by a panel on the role of renewable energy in decarbonising New Zealand. We then move on to an opposition address from National MP Andrew Bailey, followed by a ministerial address by the Minister of Transport, the Honourable Michael Wood. In the afternoon, we move to a panel on public transport and urban regener regeneration. And we'll hear from the Infrastructure Commission who will present the New Zealand draft and strategy. Later on in the afternoon, Fran O'Sullivan will facilitate a political panel with the Honourable Michael Wood, the Honourable Julianne Genta, Simon Court and David Bennett. And we'll finish up this afternoon on a real high note, which will be the Beacon Awards and that will be presented by the Honourable Poto Williams, Minister of Building and Construction. So, absolutely a jam-packed day. To get us started, it's my very great pleasure to introduce Carl Nicholson, and Carl is the Executive Director of Resources, Energy and Infrastructure at ANZ. He is responsible for Resources, Energy and Infrastructure at ANZ, and has played a central role in ANZ's support for the infrastructure sector, including today being premium sponsor to the Building Nations Conference and indeed has been since uh, 2011. He is responsible for financing a diverse set of companies from electricity, construction, telecommunications, water, education, PPPs, central and local government and oil and gas. I don't think there's anything left out of that in terms of the infrastructure remit, Carl. ANZ's breadth across the New Zealand business community provides Carl with a unique position to participate in and contribute to insight-led solutions for New Zealand's infrastructure on a broad pan-sector basis. Carl, over to you and welcome. 
Thank you, Margaret. Uh, Tēnā koutou. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Day 3 of Building Nations. And we welcome the Honourable Dr Megan Woods. It was wonderful to have you here today, along with uh, broad representation from the Infrastructure New Zealand members. I hope you're able to see a short video clip we played earlier. It's part of our story about 26 Araha, a built-to-rent complex recently completed in uh, Auckland suburb of Sandringham. The full video is available in the event website and I encourage you to take a look. The housing shortage in New Zealand cities has focused attention not only on building more homes, but constructing the sort of properties that are in line with the new ideas about how people live, how they interact with others and the impact on the environment. It's the case for the expanding rental market as well as owner occupied buildings. 26 Araha is now one of the country's greenest apartment buildings and has just been shortlisted in this year's New Zealand Architecture Awards. In many ways, the project provided a proof point for us, showing that the environmental and social aspects of developments can and should play a strong, as strong a part in our funding decisions. There is a major focus on new infrastructure delivery as we look forward to a post-COVID environment. The key will be continuing to deliver with an inspired approach and sustainable lens to future-proof key infrastructure that brings tangible long-term benefits for New Zealand communities and support that transition to lower carbon economy. With that, I'm delighted to introduce and hand over to our Minister of Housing, Minister of Energy and Resources, Minister of Research, Science and Innovation and Associate Minister of Finance. Welcome, the Honourable Dr. Megan Woods. Thanks, Carl. Tina koto ena matawaka, tina koto ena iwi o tumotu, na mata huhuia o te wā, haere, haere, haere atu rā. Hoki mai ki a tato ka na hohi ora itene, tina koto, tina koto, tina tato katoa. Well, wow, thank you for this invitation to the Building Nations virtual event and for your continued patience and perseverance with Zoom. It's a pleasure to be able to speak with you and to be able to answer questions that you may have. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the event organisers, Infrastructure New Zealand, and wish all of the finalists of tonight's Beacon Awards the best of luck. It's fitting that this year's theme is a fork in the road. It's about boldly committing to big decisions to propel us forward. As I look back on 2021, as I'm sure we all are, a number of hard, bold and big decisions this government has made that have affected many of us here today and that have saved many lives. In line with this theme, I want to talk a little about what this government is doing in housing and urban development to address the, the three significant crises we are facing today. The housing crisis, the climate crisis, and of course, you can't give a speech in 2021 without talking about the impact of COVID-19. As we all know, fixing any crisis requires a collective effort. We all must play our part. This government firmly believes everybody should have access to a warm, secure, affordable home, whether they rent or own. And COVID-19 has made this even more important because our homes have been our first lines of defence. The stark reality is that we continue to face a housing crisis. There are, there are many causes, but in simple terms, decades of underinvestment does not make good foundations for a reliable pipeline of supply, and especially affordable homes. So what can be done? What, ha what has been responding to the, we have been responding to the housing crisis on three fronts. Firstly, pro by providing immediate support to our most vulnerable. This includes housing rough sleepers and supporting people in motels and temporary accommodation. Through the Aotearoa New Zealand Homelessness Action Plan, we aim to support more than 10,000 people at risk or of or who have been experiencing homelessness over a period of three years. We're also increasing supply, improving affordability and enabling infrastructure. This includes massive investment into things like stormwater pipes, sewage systems and roads through our $3.8 billion housing acceleration fund. This will increase the pace and scale of our house build 
for both home ownership and rental, and will make sure a good proportion of this new supply is affordable for Kiwi households. And thirdly, we're undertaking, a fu we're undertaking fundamental reforms to better respond to people's housing needs. This includes reform of the Resource Management Act, the implementation of the National Policy Statement Urban Development, and the Emissions Reduction Plans. Only by making progress on all three of these strategic priorities can we begin to turn the tide. As already outlined, investment in infrastructure has been identified as one of the key actions the government can take to increase housing supply. We've listened. We're investing more than any government has since the 1970s on enabling infrastructure to ramp up our house building program. We know there is a real mismatch with what's required and what exists right now, and that councils have struggled to keep up with the amount of investment needed to fix failing or aging infrastructure and to provide new infrastructure to cater for population growth and to address climate change. One of the ways we are attacking this problem is the short term, in the short term is through the contestable $1 billion Infrastructure Acceleration Fund for iwi, councils and developers. I'm pleased to say that there have been more than 80 proposals that have now gone through to the next stage of our process, with successful applicants invited to submit a response to an RFP by December 17th. When it comes to what we're looking for in these proposals, we want projects that enable housing in areas of greatest need, that are more affordable, support the denser development enabled by the National Policy Statement on Urban Development and the new upzoning bill, and are developed in partnership with Mana Whenua. We have also recently announced Auckland's first big chunk of the Housing Acceleration Funding, with $282 million to be spent on large-scale projects, which is a massive and much-needed investment in Tamaki Makaurau. Large-scale projects are 20-year programs to renew neglected suburbs and accelerate our housing delivery. With more public housing, more homes for first-home buyers, and a greater supply of homes on the market to house the growing and changing population. These large-scale projects are brownfield developments being delivered in our main urban areas. To date, the government has committed to six large-scale projects across five suburbs in Auckland, in one in Eastern Porirua. Further funding decisions, further decisions on funding for large scale projects in Eastern Porirua and Auckland will follow next year. And of course, we can't have a grown up conversation about housing infrastructure without mentioning three waters. The government is also putting in significant amounts of money into the desperately needed three waters reform of drinking, waste, and storm water to ensure every New Zealander has access to clean, safe drinking water and to meet modern environmental and public health requirements without ballooning costs to households. These reforms have been long signalled. In, in our manifesto, we committed to tackling big issues that others have long neglected in order to future-proof New Zealand. As a government, we also know we have to keep looking at new ways of working. If we want real and lasting change, and that's why we're looking at new opportunities such as Build to Rent. I did see the video, Carl. Also known as purpose-built rentals, Build to Rent is a term for medium to large-scale residential housing developments specifically built to provide long-term rental accommodation to tenants. Build to Rent represents a great opportunity to increase the supply of secure, affordable and quality rental developments and aligns with a number of our key housing objectives including improving rental supply, quality, affordability and security of tenure. As you're probably aware, the government has proposed rules to limit interest deduct deductibility for residential property investors. The changes to interest deductibility were first announced in March of the government housing package. The legislation does not include a carve out from the interest limitation rules for the new build to rent sector. However, we have sought further advice and will make decisions in the coming weeks on whether there should be an extension beyond the 20-year period for some or all of the sector. The government has also been tackling climate change as a priority as part of our vision for a better future. 
As we know, if New Zealand is to reach its climate change goals, including net zero carbon by 2050, the building and construction sector must play its part. The sector currently accounts for around 20% of New Zealand's carbon emissions. These are created when buildings are constructed and through the operational energy use over their lifetime. We are now producing a roadmap for how the sector can respond to this long-term work program, Building for Climate Change, aimed at reducing emissions and making sure our buildings are prepared for the future effects of climate change. As the government's lead developer for housing, Kainga Ora is also working hard in this space. It is required to ensure its customers and assets are not unduly exposed to climate change induced hazards and to invest in ways that seek to reduce whole of life emissions. This work includes carbon neutral housing and developing new pilot projects to respond to proposed changes to New Zealand's building standards and climate action focused regulatory environment. Waste minimisation is also central to more sustainable housing and Kainga Ora, the government's primary housing and urban development delivery arm and one of the country's largest builders, is changing its site clearance policy from demolition as a default to a waste hierarchy approach of relocate, deconstruct and demolish. It is also implementing a minimum waste diversion target of 80% across its Auckland site clearance and achieved 87% of demolition waste diverted from landfill. This will be expanded nationally. So too, the government is developing a pipeline of trials to demonstrate the integration of solar panels on different types of housing stock. As part of its commitment to sustainability, Kainga Ora has actively stepped into the global green building movement by committing all its new homes will be built to Homestar 6 standards. This means homes will be built to be warmer, healthier and more energy efficient for tenants and for their whanau. And finally, an outstanding example of the government applying innovation and sustainability to the building of its homes is Ngā Kainga Anamata. Launched last month, Ngā Kainga Anamata is a sustainability innovation pilot project that will shape the way for the construction industry in Aotearoa. The project was selected as only one of 17 initiatives worldwide to be on show in the COP26 Build Better Now virtual pavilion. With building to commence in early to mid-2022, the project will deliver 30 new homes for our most vulnerable people within five three-level apartment buildings in Auckland's Glendowie. Each near-identical building will use a different construction technology, enabling sustainability insights to be gathered on a range of building materials and systems. So as I start to wrap up with the third challenge we are facing, the COVID-19 crisis, I, th I think the fact that we are doing this event virtually illustrates the impact it has had on our lives and the way that we have come to work together. We are committed to solving the housing crisis and the climate crisis, and we are making good progress despite the impacts of COVID-19. But we must acknowledge that the wider impacts of COVID-19 have hampered that progress in many areas. For example, constructive product, construction productivity the actual ability to build homes has been constrained through disruptions to building materials as well as labour shortages. In response to building materials and labour shortages as a short-term measure, we restarted the manufacturing of critical building products in Auckland in Alert Level 4. We've also begun, we've also begun break bulk shipping with interventions in place to support port capacity in Auckland and Tauranga. In response to labour shortages, we are working to attract highly skilled workers where they are needed in the sector while ensuring that there are jobs for New Zealanders. We have also announced a pathway for temporary migrants who are already in New Zealand to remain and to seek residence. But more than anything in our fight against COVID-19, there is just one simple message, please get vaccinated. So to wrap up, as a country, we have a lot of good work in progress but we know that there is more to do. The housing and urban systems need to deliver more homes and support communities and local economies with jobs, education and services. At the same time, we need to ensure we protect our natural environment, adapt to climate change 
and transition to a more sustainable, low emissions economy. And while we have laid the groundwork for changes, the biggest results will emerge in the medium to longer term. Thank you, and I look forward to taking your questions. Uh, thank you, Minister. You certainly covered a lot of ground there and, um, and appreciate uh, your offer for questions. Um, you said you covered quite a bit. I, I might start off with just with a couple of uh, things I picked up on. Um, you, you mentioned around, um, you know, the settings around the bill to rent. Is, is there any thought on the government itself playing a role in the bill to rent, either, you know, kind of or widening its remit or, or other sort of government areas? Look, Carl, a really good question. And we've been looking at Bill to Rent um, for quite some time now. We set up, of course, the steering group um, with people from industry um, giving us insight into to what is needed to really develop a sector of the New Zealand housing market that, that exists in most other places in some kind of scale in the OECD, but is still in quite its infancy in New Zealand. I think there's um, a range of opportunities that range from um, it being a, a product that can sit between our public and our market rentals, very much in that affordable rental space. And that well could be a, a, a role for either Kainga or, or, or some of our other community housing providers, um, or indeed our councils, um, to look um, at how they could be active in that space, um, right through to, to what we need to enable the market as well. So um, we're looking at the options right across the continuum, because I think it's got really exciting potential right through and we've seen some some new um some new developments being announced in, in recent weeks great thanks for that um also i mean you mentioned and that's a bit of a, a lot of people discussing at the moment you know we're due to covid we're we're facing supply issues we're also facing labor issues and um you know there's many stories of people wanting to get builders work done and, and not that and not those people being available. Is there a risk currently with um, the government's continued build out that there is a risk of crowding out the private sector? And that's something that we've been really conscious of, that we know that um, in order to fulfil the ambition, ambitions that we need around house building in New Zealand, whether that is the, the public or the private sector that is building it, um, that there were workforce constraints. We had a housing crisis and um, the cyclical nature of the New Zealand construction sector really ha has meant that we've seen uh, post GFC, that we've seen a real reduction in that workforce. It's one of the reasons why we've made um, skills training such an important part and strand of our of our strategy of how it is that we're going to address the housing crisis. So Kaingaora, for example, has around 200 apprentices through its build, part, yeah. build partners. Um, we've, of course, the government has put significant resources into bringing more apprentices on stream and also looking at what we can do to further develop that, develop that. But I think one of the biggest things that the government can do alongside the private sector to um, make sure that we don't have the boom and bust, not only in our construction, construction sector, but the workforce that um, sits alongside and the skills that are needed uh, for that sector is to make sure that we, are, that we are using our pipeline of projects to provide certainty for businesses, that they can keep people employed, and that we can be a bit of a smoother and a counter-cyclical force here. And I think when we see, um, for example, Kaiwa Aura's build program out to 2024, with the 18,000 houses that will be added um, um, cumulatively over that period of time, that there's long-term contracting. We're trying to move beyond just buying a house at a time or contracting a builder to, to build a house at a time, but um, giving some certainty, which in turn allows um, those businesses to invest in their own workforce and in training. So I think we have to work to this, work to this together and not see it about who's crowding out who, because the fact of the matter, whether they're public or they're privately provided houses, we need houses in New Zealand. We simply don't have enough. Thanks. A question here that's come in around, um, obviously there's uh, COP26 has been happening. Uh, there's quite a strong focus on the built environment. Where do you look to cities around the world who are doing this well? 
uh, and using technologies, et cetera, to adapt how we live and um, construct our housing. Yeah, so I think if we're thinking about um, how it is that we can reduce em emissions from from um, our built environment, there's a number of cities around the world and there's various strands, and I think we can look at it. It's not only our construction techniques and the standards that we're building to and making sure that we're building energy efficient homes that will require less, less heating and less energy themselves, um, but it's also in terms of the, the waste minimization. But one of the critical pieces in terms of um, how it is that we can build climate resilient cities is through ensuring that we are um, that we are creating the kinds of density that will support alternative modes of transport as well, and that will because we know that one of our largest pieces of uh, one of our largest sectors for emissions in New Zealand is through the transport sector. So we have to be taking an urban development approach to this, and it's why we need to. Work, I work really closely with my colleague um, Minister Wood. It gets a bit confusing, Minister Woods and Wood, uh, but that we can work closely together. Um, with the urban development portfolio that sits with housing gives us a real opportunity to bring ministers together. So I think we can look to a range of cities that are, are doing various things, right through from construction technique right through to urban planning and draw those together and i think we could you know probably all rattle them off many of them are in europe many of them are in the states some of them are in australia and i think that the critical thing for us here in new zealand is to make sure that we're taking the best of all of those but transport is a critical part of how it is that we can address those climate issues thanks there's been a number of questions around um you know the recent uh, announcements cross-party announcements around the new housing plans. I guess the question is, is with those plans announced, how will the government ensure that um, this, this new intensified houses doesn't create ghettos and that it also ensures New Zealand remains a place, a beautiful country that we all want to live, work and play in? Yeah, and I, th I think there's several aspects to that. One is the, um, the I, th I think there's been um, some misunderstanding of exactly what it is that it is allowed under the rules. Certainly I've seen some, some pictures that would indicate that. But the, in terms of the density um, that, is being, that is being enabled, it's 50% of a section so that we're not going to have, um, you know, so, some of the, I think some people are quite fearful that we're going to see, um, how, um, that we're going to see complexes right up next to each other you're only allowed to build on 50% of the site without getting a resource consent. So um, it's not the Wild West. Um, there's still a planning framework out there. But I think the other critical thing is these are houses that are being built by the market in, in most cases um, that need to be sold to people. Um, they've got to be appealing to people. And the, the, this is also enabling legislation. This isn't saying that um, you have to build to this density in any one part or any one section, but what it's saying is that the government's not going to stop you building the kind of urban form that we know will lead to more affordable outcomes, more climate resilient cities, all the kinds of things that we're we're striving for. And I think that um, there's, a, there's a lot of anxiety, I think, about um, density and what it will do in terms of um, the, the, how our cities look and feel. But I mean, I know when I visit some parts of the country where there is medium density, there's some incredibly attractive buildings, some well-designed buildings. I think New Zealand's starting to, to evolve quite a, a, a vernacular, as it were, in, a, in its own form of density. We're not seeing um, necessarily um, that we're re achieving the uplift in housing through incredibly high density, a la Singapore or somewhere like that. We're doing it at three and four and five storey um, medium density homes, and that three storey does give us the opportunity to do that. Thank you. There's obviously been a lot of talk around the main centres and housing shortage, etc. Uh, what's the government's views on on the regions where I guess the housing story is a little bit different, where it's around quality of stock and um, and health and, and affordability, safety, I think, as well. One of the yeah. things that um, that one of the first jobs that I did when I became Minister of Housing was look at what we could do around reactivating public housing again in some of our regions. We knew that um, that we had um, um, levels of homelessness outside of our city that we're starting to see affordability issues really creep in, and there were some very technical changes and tweaks 
that needed to be made outside of our main cities, that one was the rent maxima, the difference that is paid between the income-related rent subsidy um, and what a tenant pays, uh, was set that really only incentivised either kind or chips to build in our main urban centres. And really it was one of the, I think, one of the, the leaders that we could pull to end the fact that we weren't seeing any new uh, public or affordable houses being built um, and, and affordable rentals being built in those regional centres. So we've made a, a change there and for the first time in, in several decades, we're actually starting to see a public house build, a house build happen outside of our main urban centres. But one of the things that we also know is in terms of new housing, um, getting the infrastructure in, in, in order to enable that is also an issue for many of our tier two and tier one, uh, tier three councils. So um, we've been really deliberate with the infrastructure acceleration fund that we didn't want this just to be about metros, um, that we also wanted this to be about some of our smaller um, provincial towns um, and cities where we know that there is also housing need, but in order to enable that, that we do need infrastructure. And I guess the Rotorua is, is a really good example of where some roading has opened up some really good opportunities for more housing development. Um, look, there's a lot of uh, housing questions coming through. I might just use this opportunity, if I can, just to branch away just into one of your other portfolios around energy. Um, I guess my question is, is, you know, we see a large pipeline of renewable energy investment coming on. Do you, do you think the regulatory settings uh, are there to support that and also um, where the EMA reviews coming and, and sort of what your expectations are of that around sort of the wholesale market? Yeah, so look, I sit on the RMA reform group of ministers, not only as the Minister of Housing, but also as the Minister of Energy and Resources, so that we can be making sure that as we reform that legislation, that we are making sure it is enabling and that we are um, May, that we are creating an environment where we can um, have not only the investment and the consenting of resource management uh, of, of renewable energy projects, but we actually see those going to construction. Um, we are seeing a steady pipeline. I think there's been around $2 billion worth of investment in renewable projects over the last few years, but we need more. Um, I think we're seeing some exciting new things um, evolve within the um, energy generation, renewable energy generation sector, one of which I think is around PPAs, which I think for in tying into the next part of your question around the um, the wholesale market. So power purchase agreements, we're really um, long-term contracting is underwriting the, the um, financing of the building of those renewable projects. That's something that I'm keen um, to, to dig into a bit more and make sure we've got a, as enabling environment as we require in this country to make sure we can unleash the potential of that. In terms of um, the wholesale market, I think one of the critical things that we have to address um, that underlies our market, um, and that, that is dry year storage, um, and how it is that we're going to account for that in a world that is combating climate change, and one where we do see a rising cost of climate. Storing energy for a dry year in the form of fossil fuels, whether that be through oil or gas, is, cannot be New Zealand's long-term future if we're going to realise all our potential, that we have the ability to unleash the power of far, the far cheaper renewable forms of energy if we've got renewable ways of storage. So that's why we're investing the, the $100 million into the, um, the New Zealand Battery Project, which is looking at pumped hydro um, in a range of locations around New Zealand, but obviously with Onslow as the base case, but then looking at some comparative technologies through there as well. And there's the ongoing work with the EA, with the Electricity Authority um, around the wholesale markets. And there's a range of um, initiatives that st are still coming out of the Electricity Pricing Review around um, sort of market making powers that sit alongside the energy markets. Appreciate that, Minister. Um, some more questions back on, on the housing front and, and you covered in your, um, in your address around the good work that Kayanga War is doing around sustainability and and recycling as opposed to to you know just just waste and demolition. Is is there more? Well, there presumably there's more the private sector 
can do? What would you like to see them do? And is there any sort of regulatory settings or anything that, that you are looking at um, for the private sector in that space? Yeah, look, I think one of the, the really good things and the heartening things for me um, through Kaiangora's um, program around uh, both building to, to um, <laughs> Homestar 6 and the Waste Minimisation program is, of course, that Kaiangora um, doesn't build the houses itself. It has, um, it has private um, developers and builders building those houses for it. And I think given the scale that we're now building at, um, in terms of our public house build and the work that we're doing in our LSPs, we're actually able to work with our build partners around how it is that we can actually get the costs down of some of the some of these practices. And we're actually made really good progress on that. And because we're building at scale, of course, our build partners don't only build for us. This is a chance for us to work with the industry around um, good practice and how it is that we can get the economics of that right as well. So I think that that's been a really positive step when you're building 1,800 houses a year um, that you do have an um, ability to influence practice. We're, of course, also doing work through the, the construction accord, and I think that construction accord has been a really important um, tool that we and the government has had to, to, um, to bring the industry together to work through a range of these issues but of course, in something that I know that the Accord partners are really keen for us to, to get into um, even more fully is the potential for off-site manufacturing in this space as well. Because off-site manufacturing is far more um, of a, uh, as the name suggests, a manufacturing approach, approach that there can be really good opportunities for waste minimization in there as well. But um, as you know, there's also a work uh, program across government in terms of waste minimization. The less we can la send to landfills, the better it is for us um, from all aspects of our environmental health, um, whether that be um, the beauty um, and ecology of, of the land, but also our emissions. Landfill creates emissions. Thank you. Sort of, a, I guess, a little bit of a segue. You mentioned around um, uh, the work that did during COVID around, you know, freeing up some building supplies. Is there is there any work that's being done on longer term around um, availability of, of building supplies and, and competitiveness of those? Yeah, well, I, we, there's, the, um, there's the market study um, that has been carried out in, yep. into building supplies, and that's work that um, my colleague, um, the Minister of Commerce, has underway. Um, but we have these new market powers, market study powers for the Commerce Commission, so that's something that's being looked at. But I think the immediate issue around making sure that we are addressing some of the, comply, the supply, supply chain constraints is, is a priority for us as a government. Again, I point to the work that we've been able to do with the Accord. Um, the, this was um, an initiative that was pulled together, I think it was in 2019, but I have to say th through our COVID response, response has been um, a fantastic grouping for us to be able to pull together how it was that we could get protocols in place so that we could get construction back up and running at level three, but also a place for us to come together and think about how it is that we can address some of those supply constraints that we're facing in the immediate term. It was through that grouping that we were able um, to, um, to work to have a protocol that meant we could identify where the, the, the tightest pinch points were in level four in Auckland and how it, is, how it was that we could get some manufacturing back up and running of some of those critical supplies. So continuing a number of work streams right across government, uh, across building supplies, because we know when we're doing as much infrastructure build as we are as a government, having access to supplies at a reasonable cost is absolutely critical to our work program. Thank you. Um, the Urban Development Authority is, is the idea that that works together with the likes of people like Kaying or and, and using its powers to to develop, you know, these new communities, etc. I mean, where's where's the sort of the work on that at the moment? Yeah, so I think one of the things that um, a massively expanded role for Kaying or in the last few years, not just being sort of the landlord of an existing public housing stock that's sort of you know built up over the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. 
uh, but again, being an active builder, but also it, it does have urban development powers, which I think um, we're, that are relatively new and I think provide some really exciting opportunities for how it is that we can get momentum into some of our urban development um, projects around the country, um, that we've put in place some tools. And I think it is very much about those partnerships, um, about how it is that we can unleash the potential. And I think that that there's um, still some work to do. If I was going to point to some work that we still had to do, um, that's about um, working, I think, to bring greater understanding and um, spotlight on exactly what those U UDA powers are. Thank you. I might um, chop back over to um, to energy again. So um, New Zealand made commitments in COP26 around you know future oil and gas uh, exploration and production. Um, what's your view on on the gas sector and, and its role? It's it's got to play sort of now in the future with with that transition to to the renewable energy picture in New Zealand. So certainly um, gas will be a transition fuel um, as we get to, uh, um, as we reduce not only electricity, but energy, um, our whole of energy, fossil fuel use, um, that we made, when we made our decisions around ending new offshore permits in 2018, obviously the existing permits um, were respected and many of those go through to the, you know, to 20, 30, 40 years of life in them and we'll have gas production for several decades in New Zealand. We continued that we we continued the onshore um, offer, but one of the things I want to do next year is when we bring together one of the recommendations of the Climate Commission is that we develop a whole of um, New Zealand energy strategy, and that's a piece of work that we have slated in the work program. Is that I want us to get down to some of the, some of the detail around what is the what is the um, the quantity that we're going to need going forward in terms of gas. We know we need to phase out coal. We're seeing Fonterra starting to phase out coal, and in some places in the country, the North Island, but not the South, that does mean switching to gas. But increasingly, we're seeing a number of companies, and particularly in the South Island, switching straight to biomass or to electrification because of availability. So I think we've got to do the detailed work around security of supply across all of our um, fuel supplies, whether that be our biomass, whether that be um, electricity, or whether that be fossil fuels. Thank you, Minister, and, and thank you for your time today. Um, that's all we've got time for the questions at the moment, but we appreciate uh, you joining us today and um, hope the rest of your day continues well. Appreciate it and have a good conference. Thanks. I thank you, Minister, and thank you, Carl, for those insights and getting day three off to a great start. I guess if I reflect on what we've heard from the Minister and also from messages all through the week is a very consistent theme of we need to tackle the big issues and we need to seize the new opportunities. And as I say, it's becoming more evident to me that for the infrastructure sector, the fork in the road is for us to be bold, brave and challenge the status quo, which I guess is a very neat segue into running our poll. Once again, let's just see where we are in terms of priorities for infrastructure New Zealand as we head into 2022. So Katrina, could we just run that poll please? Interesting. Top three, don't move about too much. We're still looking at that infrastructure deficit and how to address it, followed then by very closely by climate change and still the issue of attracting the talent and retaining skills and no doubt more of that as we proceed through the day. So thank you for that first session. Uh, just remind delegates that our next session coming up is the role of renewable energy to decarbonise New Zealand. Thank you very much.